Well, good Sunday morning to you. It is good to be with you this day. My name is Jennifer Jaimez and I serve St. Mark's United Church of Christ in Bloomington, Minnesota. If the service feeds your spirit or offers you hope, please feel free to tell others about it and share the link. It, as well as all our other worship services, can be found on St. Mark's Facebook page, as well as our website, stmarksuccmn.org. On our website, you can learn more about our church, as well as learn about some of our outreach to the community. This first Sunday of October has become a time when Christians all around the world break bread and pour the cup to remember and affirm Christ as the head of the church. On this day, we remember that we are part of the whole body of believers. Whether shared in a grand cathedral or outside on a hilltop, in a meeting house or a storefront, in a living room or in a kitchen, Christians celebrate the communion liturgy in as many ways as there are Christians. I invite you to have a piece of bread or tortilla or rice cracker or flatbread and a cup with coffee or water or tea, or as I often say, if the spirit moves you, a bit of wine nearby. One of the benefits of having this service recorded is that you can always press pause, gather the bread and the cup, and then resume worship. This morning, I would like to also introduce you to someone who is joining St. Mark's for the next few months as an intern. It all came together rather quickly, but I'm pleased to welcome Scott to St. Mark's. You will be seeing him lead worship and preach throughout the year, and there will be an opportunity to meet him in person from an appropriate distance, of course, next Saturday, and I will be sending those details out soon, weather permitting. In the meantime, Scott has a greeting to share with all of you, so I'm turning it over to Scott. Hello, it is a great pleasure to worship with you here today at St. Mark's. My name is Scott Siefert, and I look forward to being in your service for the next few months. I am a member in the sermon in the Potomac Association of the Central Atlantic Conference of the United Church of Christ. I had lived in Richmond, Virginia for the last 25 years. A few years ago, I was serving on the welcome committee at St. John's United Church of Christ when I met my future life partner, Christine Wang. She had just moved here or there from Golden Valley, and God smiled upon me that day. Later, I felt called to God, by God to serve and went to seminary at Union Presbyterian Seminary in Richmond. Chris and, I, Chris and I decided to move back to her home area. We just recently moved into our new home in St. Paul. It is an honor to worship with you, and to, I look forward to getting to know you and work with you to help fulfill a desire to live into God's will and plan. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. We're glad to have you here at St. Mark's. With all of that being said, I invite you to take a breath in and a breath out so that you might calm your heart and your mind, that you might let go of whatever this morning or this afternoon or this day has already held for you as we prepare our hearts for worship. If you have a bulletin, please join me in the call to worship. Otherwise, I invite you to hear these words. Wherever we are in the world, God calls us to prepare, to remember, to share, to worship, to be formed and transformed as God's people. With our neighbors near and far, we gather at tables, in homes, outdoors, virtually, recognizing the time is now. God's kingdom is near. Come, for all is ready. Let us together join our voices in the opening hymn, In Christ There Is No East Nor West. Dan?
Thank you, Dan. Let us pray. We praise you, extraordinary God, for the holiness of ordinary things, a gathering of fellow believers wherever they may be this day, a song of praise, a prayer of thanksgiving, a word, a loaf of bread, a cup, a fountain of water. May your spirit seep into the cracks and crevices of our hearts that we might know you more fully and worship you more deeply. Amen. So it's time for the young people to come a little bit closer to the screen. If you are far away, come nearby. So we might pretend that we are all together in this space that we used to gather every Sunday. And now we do it, of course, via the screen. One of the things I love, well, you know one of the things that I love is M&Ms. But I'm not going to talk about M&Ms this morning. I'm going to talk about bread. I also love bread. Do you like bread? What do you like on your bread? How about just butter? Do you like peanut butter and jelly? And if you do, what kind of jelly do you like? Do you like strawberry or blueberry or rhubarb or orange marmalade, which is really not that good, but I hear some people like it? Peanut butter jelly. How about on your bread? Do you ever put lots of cheese on your bread and then butter the outsides and put it on the stove or probably someone helps you and you have a grilled cheese sandwich? Ugh, I love bread. You know, people all over the world eat bread, but not all bread looks the same. Some bread is made from wheat and some is made from corn. Some is light and fluffy, like Marianne's bread, and some is made, some is flat. Some bread is made in the shape of a loaf, and some bread is shaped like a circle. Bread is something that you can fill with lots of good things, or you can just eat it all by itself. You can even dip it into a bowl of soup. Yum. This day is Communion Sunday. It's the day when we're invited to Christ's table to eat bread and to drink juice, remembering Jesus' life and death and resurrection. And not only is it Communion Sunday, because we celebrate communion once a month, but this is World Communion Sunday. So on this day, Christians all over the world will eat the bread and drink from the cup. Do you suppose that we are all eating the same kind of bread? Nope, probably not. Does it matter that we eat the same kind of bread? Nope, doesn't matter at all. Jesus says, take this bread, eat it, and remember me. Jesus says, drink from this cup, do so, and remember me. Remember how much I love you. Remember that you are to love one another. Jesus says, I have given my life for you so that you might have life. And anyone who gathers at Christ's table is a member of the family of Christ. No matter what language we speak or what we look like or where we live or even what kind of bread we eat. So I hope that you have a piece of bread nearby so that when we share communion together, you might eat of it too. And if you don't have a piece of bread, go find a piece and then come back and join us for the rest of the service. Let's say a prayer before you go back. Thank you, God, for all the different types of bread in this world and for all the different types of people. Thank you for your love that spreads throughout this world. Thank you that we can eat and drink at your table, and be reminded of how much you love us. Amen. Thanks for coming up. I hope you stay for the rest of the service and get in your comfy spots. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel, that on the 10th of this month, they have to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. 
the lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted over the fire with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover over the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I shall strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals, on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me all the firstborn. Whatever is the first to open the womb among the Israelites of human beings and animals is mine. Moses said to the people, Remember this day on which you came out of Egypt, out of the houses of slavery, because the Lord brought you out from there by the strength of hand. No leavened bread shall be eaten. Today, in the month of Abib, you are going out. When the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your ancestors to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you shall keep this observance in this month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a festival to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. No... No leavened bread shall be seen in your possession, and no leaven shall be seen among you in all your territory. You shall tell your child on that day, It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. God says to Moses and Aaron, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. In other words, what will happen next will mark a new beginning. The clock will restart, the calendar will reset, time will either be before or after what is coming. Isn't that extraordinary? Perhaps there, have been, there has been a moment or moments in your life where everything has changed. Parents often talk about BC and AC, right? Before children and after children because life changes so much. We as a nation often talk about life before 9-11 and life after 9-11. And I imagine that we ourselves, our nation, even our world will refer to this pandemic that we are living in as one of those moments. Remember what life was like before COVID-19? Remember what it was like after? I do believe there will be an after, but it will look different than what came before. It's really hard to imagine what we'll be saying six months from now, or a year from now, or ten years from now. As you heard before the reading, the Israelites have been oppressed and harshly treated by the Egyptians for generations, some say for over 400 years. The Israelites cry out to God, and God hears them and sends Moses and Aaron to Pharaoh to ask for the release of their people. 
The Pharaoh refuses time and time again, even after the rivers turn red with blood, even after the plagues of locusts and gnats and frogs and boils and hail and even darkness. The Pharaoh's heart is hardened and he will not let them go. So here we are on the eve of the last and most terrible of all plagues, the death of all the firstborn, human and animal. And we read that each Hebrew family is to take an unblemished lamb, not for a pet, but rather to sacrifice and to eat. And if their family is too small to eat the entire lamb, recall that there shouldn't be any left over, then they are to join with another family. They are, so to speak, to split the bill, to share in the cost and care of the lamb. This is not charity, but rather making sure that everyone has enough. Then they should keep the lamb for four days. Why? Perhaps so that there is some kind of personal connection, some kind of investment in that lamb. The lamb becomes part of the household, and when it is sacrificed, it is ritualizing a sense of loss of a member of the family. Then the whole community will slaughter their lambs at the same time at twilight. Again, another ritual. Then they are to roast the lamb with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Now any bread baker knows that yeast takes time to work. There is no time for that. So they are to eat the bread unleavened without yeast. And they're to eat all of the lamb, leave none for the next day. They are to eat it with staff in hand and sandals on feet. They are to eat it hurriedly. This is not one of those sit down leisurely talk about all the family and relatives kind of meal. This is a kind of grab and go kind of meal. And it's no ordinary meal. As we can already guess, it is a Passover meal. They are to take some of the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorposts of their home so that when that last terrible plague hits and the Lord goes through the land killing the firstborn the Lord will pass over the Israelites homes and spare them only the firstborn of the Egyptians will be affected oftentimes we read or hear that it is the angel of death or the destroyer that passes through that land but the scripture reading says that it is the Lord that will pass through the land striking down all firstborns and giving judgment on the gods of Egypt. This is a difficult text to hear. Does God really need a sign to know where the Israelites live? Don't we kind of think God knows where we live, where they lived? Perhaps the blood on the doorpost symbolizes the blood that has already been shed by the Israelites, those 400 plus years in captivity. Or perhaps the blood symbolizes that the Israelites' houses are marked for life and not for death. Perhaps the blood on the doorposts are for the Israelites themselves, recalling the sacrifice of the land and the, of the lamb and the many years of living their lives in captivity. Yes is almost always the right answer when faced with more than one interpretation or understanding. Rituals and symbols often hold more than one meaning. You might also notice that there is no rejoicing in the Passover meal over the death of the firstborns, even when it is their enemy. It is only after God has brought Israel safely through the Red Sea waters that shouts of victory and thanksgiving are raised to heaven. There is so much ritual in these few short verses, and that is the power of ritual. It points to something beyond itself. It gives shared meaning to those who join in. It tells a story that is passed down from generation to generation. None of those who were in bondage to Egypt, who witnessed the plagues, who put blood on the doorposts, who ate of the meal, lived to enter the promised land. None except Joshua and Caleb. So the purpose of this ritual, as we read on, is to recall what God has done for God's people 
and to pass on that telling generation after generation after generation. Moses tells the people, remember this. Tell your children when you have come to the land promised to you how God brought God's people out of bondage in Egypt. Every year, tell the story. Every year on this month, eat unleavened bread for seven days, recalling what God has done for you. Remember who you are and whose you are. Never forget. This meal, while originally for those in Egypt, is even more so for those generations who came afterwards so that they too might take part in the story. And so year after year, decade after decade, century after century, observant Jews celebrate the Passover. Several of us have had the opportunity to participate in a Passover meal at Temple Israel in Minneapolis. There is liturgy read and food shared and eaten, symbolic food, all for the purpose of telling the story of how God saved God's people so long ago. On the plate, there is an egg symbolizing new life. There's horseradish and parsley symbolizing the bitterness of captivity. There's salt water for tears shed. There's haroset, a mixture of apples and nuts and cinnamon representing the mortar that was used by the Israelites who were forced to make bricks. There's matzah, unleavened bread, remembering the haste in which the meal was prepared and eaten. And there is wine or grape juice to drink at certain parts in telling of the story. It is a powerful experience. And if you ever get an invitation to join in a Passover meal, I encourage you to do it. Observing the Passover year after year is an important tradition for people of the Jewish faith. It reminds them of who they are and whose they are. And as Christians, we too have our traditions and our rituals that remind us of who we are and whose we are. Each Advent, we light the candles week by week as we watch and wait for the coming of the Christ child. And on Christmas Eve, we light the Christ candle, symbolizing the light that Christ brings into the world. On Ash Wednesday, we're marked with ashes to remind us of our mortality and our sin as we begin the Lenten journey to the cross. Monday, Thursday includes the sharing of Holy Communion as we hear the last events of Jesus' life. And it ends in darkness as the altar is left bare with only the Christ candle lit upon it. Easter with its flowers and especially joyful music and outfits and jelly beans everywhere tells the story of the empty tomb and that death and sin do not have the final word. We celebrate Pentecost, which brings with it the excitement of the church being brought to life and the presence of the Holy Spirit upon those first disciples as tongues of fire rest upon each one, releasing them from fear and sending them out into the world to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Our common life as people of faith is shaped year after year when we gather to tell, to remember, to share the story of Jesus the Christ. This is especially true with baptism and communion called sacraments in the Protestant church, sacred rituals. In baptism, whether immersed or sprinkled with water, we are marked with the cross of Christ and sealed with the Holy Spirit and welcomed into new life. In Holy Communion, we eat the bread and we drink from the fruit of the vine, remembering Jesus' life and death and resurrection as we await Christ's return at the end of time. You might remember that when Jesus gathered with his disciples for the last time at the table, they were sharing a Passover meal. For Christians, the symbols of bread and wine take on new meaning as Jesus offered them as signs of the new covenant, his body broken, his blood shed out of love for God's children. We remember God's saving act in the death and resurrection of Christ and for all who believe. Our rituals not only tell the story of our faith, but they remind us of who we are and whose we are. They tell of God's great love for all God's creation and that we too are God's beloved. They tell of God's inexhaustible reaching out time and time again to all people, inviting them into relationship with the one who truly gives life. 
They tell of the gift of forgiveness and second chances. They remind us that in spite of what the world might say, love always wins over hate, and God can and does transform death into life. The Passover meal, the blood on the doorposts, the mark of water, the sharing of the bread and the fruit of the vine are signs that point toward the Holy One. They point toward God's promise and God's commitment. They tell the story of our faith from generation to generation, and they continue to define and shape who we are as disciples of Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. So we're still good. we got more. <laughs> I'll cut that part out too. We have been richly blessed so that we might be a blessing to others. I invite you to continue to give to the mission and ministry of this church. We do have electronic payment that is now available on our website. There are some glitches with it for some people, but I invite you to give that a try if you'd like. Otherwise, we are happy to accept donations sent to the church. So thank you for your generosity. Let us continue with the moment of silent prayer where we lift up to God all those concerns on our heart, all those worries and fears, all those blessings that we might name. And then after a moment of silence, I will join us together in the pastoral prayer. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we give thanks to you for hearing all our prayers, those named aloud and those whispered only to you in the quiet of our hearts. We give thanks that you hear all our prayers, know all our worries and uncertainties and fears, and that you carry our burdens with and for us each and every day. Holy God, as we continue to live in the midst of the wilderness, in the midst of strangeness, help us to lean into you so that we do not lose trust. Help us to recall your faithfulness time and time again. Be with us as we navigate unfamiliar territory, Help us to not give in to despair. Guide us with wisdom. Let us be convinced to do what we need to do for the sake of us all, even when inconvenient or uncomfortable. When we are frustrated, grant us patience. When we are tired, grant us rest. We continue to pray for all those whom we know and love, those who are in need of strength or healing or wisdom or peace or peace or employment, or safety. We pray for all those we do not know who are also in deep need. Help us to be your hands and feet in this world of ours. Help us to live our lives so that others may know us by our love. This day we especially pray for Marilyn and her family as Marilyn has entered into hospice care. May she know the peace of your love surrounding her every moment until her last breath. Holy God, we also pray for our world where there is so much unrest, so little peace, so much need. Empower us to be your hands and feet in this world of ours. We pray for the leaders of this nation and of this world. We pray that they might make decisions that benefit all people and not just some that they be open to the cries of all and work toward peace. Remind us each and every day to offer you thanks. Thanks for the many blessings, the gift of life and breath, the gift of one another, the gift of food and shelter, the gift of your love. Help us to lean into you and one another in the days yet to come. Help us to trust that you are with us and that we truly dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hear all these prayers, spoken and unspoken, as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
You invite us, Holy One, out of our places of testing in our wonderings about the possibility of rebirth for the sake of our yearnings for life-giving waters and bread enough for all into new ways and hopes of seeing. So gathered, may we open ourselves to you. We give thanks, O oh God, for your steady presence all through our journeys, whether in wilderness or community, whether in word or sacrament, you come to us, seeking our wholeness, binding our wounds, challenging our presumptions, restoring our life. And so we join with the song of witnesses long past and yet to come. Holy, holy, holy one, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Our praise flows from and toward the mystery of your grace. Such mystery marks this table before us where disciples of old gathered on the eve of betrayal and Jesus broke bread and shared the cup. The gifts of bread and wine were offered to all, even to the ones who betrayed and denied, even to the ones who fled into the night, even to them, so that this table might also be opened even to us. We remember that on that night, Jesus took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to each gathered there and said, take and eat, do this in remembrance of me. And he took the cup and he filled it and he lifted it up and he blessed it and he gave it to each of those gathered there and said, take and drink. This cup is the new covenant. Drink this in remembrance of me. We are one bread, one body, one cup of blessing. Though we are many throughout the earth and this church community is scattered, we are one in Christ. In your many kitchens and living rooms, rest your hands lightly upon these elements which you set aside this day to be a sacrament and let us ask God's blessing upon them. Gentle Redeemer, there is no lockdown on your blessing, no quarantine on grace. Send your spirit of life and love, power and blessing upon every table where your child shelters in place, that this bread may be broken and gathered in love, that this cup poured out to give hope to all. Risen Christ, live in us that we may live in you. Breathe in us that we may breathe in you. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you now to take your piece of bread and eat it in remembrance of Christ, who offers to all the bread of life. And then I invite you to take your cup and to take a drink of it. Drink of it and remember Christ, whose blood was shed for you and who offers to all the cup of blessing. Let us pray. We give thanks for the meal of grace, rejoicing by, but rejoicing that by the very method of our worship, we have embodied the truth that Christ's love is not limited by buildings made with human hands, nor contained in human ceremonies, but blows as free as the spirit in all places. Spirit of Christ, you have blessed our tables and our lives. May the eating of this bread give us courage to speak faith and act love not only in church sanctuaries, but in your precious world. And may the drinking of this cup renew our hope, even in the midst of this pandemic. Wrap your hopeful presence around all whose bodies, spirits, and hearts need healing, and let us become your compassion and safe refuge. Amen. Let us join our voices for the closing hymn this day, Go, my children, with my blessing. Dan.
Thank you, Dan. Hear now the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with kindness and grant you peace this day and forevermore. And let all God's people say, Amen. God's peace be with you until we meet again.